David, thank you very much. Um, I apologize for not being able to be with you uh, due to the pandemic. Um, academics in Poland and Germany alike are living in an ideal world, at least theoretically. Both our countries have constitutions that explicitly guarantee academic freedom. Article 73 of the Constitution of the Republic of Poland says the freedom of academic research and to publish its result is granted to everyone. Similarly, Article 5, Sentence 3 of the German Grundgesetz rules the freedom of academic teaching and research. Academic freedom being explicitly entrenched in a country's constitution is relatively uncommon. Most constitutions subsume the freedom of research and teaching under the heading of free speech. In this short paper, I'm going to ask what academic freedom means and by whom it is threatened. Who can claim academic freedom and for what kind of activity? Who's got to protect it and how? And who is currently compromising it as the fact that academic freedom is being compromised can hardly be disputed. First, academic freedom is a right of the individual against the state. It means that it is the government's responsibility to make sure that whoever engages in research and academic teaching is unharmed by any attempts at infringing their activities, as long as they are themselves constitutional. Can an academic who descends into the political arena and agitates, say, for the boycott Israel movement, claim academic freedom? No, because they have left the space of academia and entered a different one, protected merely by free speech. Can a researcher who is promoting creationism, chemtrails, or the idea that the earth is flat claim academic freedom? Most likely not, since all such nonsense is in blatant disagreement with scientifically proven facts and well outside the parameters of what can be considered state of the art. You gather where this is going. What if things are not as unequivocal as in the chemtrail or flat earth supposition? What, for instance, if the climatologist holds a minority position in the debate on climate change? Or if one field of research, say gender studies, departs from propositions that would be described by experts of another field, biology, for example, as utterly unscientific? In my opinion, the only answer to that question, which will not be leading into aporia, is a radically libertarian one. Research and teaching can be performed in any field of academia, and it is academic as long as it adheres to a clearly defined set of methodologies. Both the gender studies researcher and the climatologist can therefore claim academic freedom as long as they uh, stick to a set, set of uh, rules and methodologies. Whoever rejects a radically libertarian approach to academic freedom will have to explain as to why they privilege certain schools of thought and certain disciplines over others. Second, what responsibilities arise from academic freedom for the government? A. It goes without saying that the government has the obligation to refrain from all attempts to compromise the freedom of researchers. This would be the case when government policy defines research questions and objectives, but also where it excludes or privileges certain constituencies on the grounds of race or gender, for instance. A sensitive question in this respect would be as to whether one should go as far as calling the imposition of, say, of a, say, equal opportunities code a breach of academic freedom. At least we are dealing with conflicting constitutional objectives here. Does the government responsibility for academic freedom prevent the government and or legislators from prioritizing research activity one over research activity two? No, policymakers are free to decide which research to fund and what priorities to set. If a government decides priority sustainable energy research over, say for example, classical studies, go ahead, they are free to do so. It may be a different thing if the granting of research funding is subject to condition, conditions such as preferential employment of women or economic employ, uh, exploitability of research results. Again, this may be a matter of competing constitutional values. B. Governments are under obligation to 
provide for climate at universities and research institutions where individual academic freedom is not infringed by any third party. Should, for example, activists make an attempt at preventing me from giving my talk this morning, the government must make sure that my academic freedom and that of my hosts will not be at risk. At state universities, the government is represented by the university leadership towards the professors and by the professors towards all other members of faculty. At private institutions, similar mechanisms ought to be in place. Third, who is a threat to academic freedom? At present, in my country, as well as in the US, the UK, and most Western European countries, the activism of left-leaning identitarians forms the single most formidable menace to academic freedom. While in the US, a single word can easily cost you your job, the situation is still a lot better in Europe. The platforming attempts usually target invited speakers, not the professional existence of academics as such. In Germany, there have been relatively few such attempts, and in the overwhelming majority of cases, further damage has been averted by the university leadership. This means that the institutional safeguarding of the individual right of academic freedom is still largely effective despite all prophecies of doom. However, it cannot be excluded that the pressure exerted by activists triggers self-censoring mechanisms within the academic community. Will someone who has got into trouble inviting a fellow academic as a guest speaker extend another invitation to his main colleague? Could something I'm saying in my lecture wreak havoc over my future career? Will a too outspoken remark alienate me from my colleagues? That one has to be aware of such risks points to the uncomfortable truth that the infringement and defense of academic freedom starts in the pre-institutional field where the spiral of silence is being set in motion because we prefer not to be heroes. This being said, the protection of the individual right of academic freedom depends as much on the individual as it does on the government. What are we supposed to do? We have to make public the names of those who agitate against our freedom, as they usually act clandestinely. We have to move the topic up the public agenda as university leaderships will feel more pressure to act on our behalf when they realize that there is public awareness. We have to vouch for our colleagues if they are targeted by those who are enemies of academic freedom, as safety lies in numbers. In short, we have to do what academics usually prefer not to do, take up the fight which has been forced upon us and show that we have some bones. Thank you very much and Godspeed for the Collegium Mariano, Inter Mariano.